The following Patreon episode is brought to you by our patrons over at patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. Here to tell you why it's important to become a patron is our favorite guest, Cam Mallow. Cam, why should they become a patron? It's important to help bring more new episodes. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thanks, Cam. So if you want to become a patron, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg and become one today. We thank you in advance. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Hey, patrons, how are you? And uh, I'm sitting here with Bob, as Hello. always. Hello, everybody. Hey, Bob. And, um, and we also have uh, Bill in the, uh, in the peanut gallery over there. How you doing over there, Bill? Just fine, Matt. That's, okay. our, that's our studio audience. Yeah, our studio audience. He likes to sit in. Uh, there's a question at the end from Bill. But anyway, uh, today we sat down with uh, Brian P. Lusky. Now, you might remember that last name, Lusky. Um, Ashley Whitehead Lusky, his wife, uh, and also the assistant director of the Civil War Institute, was on uh, the show many moons ago. Um, and uh, Brian's book, which uh, she had told us about then, um, was in the process of being completed, and it is now complete from the University of North Carolina Press. And it's called Men is Cheap, Exposing the Frauds of Free Labor in Civil War America. I thought that, uh, you know, full disclosure, Bob and I got this book with four or five days ago, a couple days ago. So we don't have the, uh, we didn't have the time to read the whole thing. So I said to Brian, Brian, uh, what would I read? If I don't have the time, what do I read? And he said, introduction in chapter four. So I told Bob and Bob read introduction and chapter one and the conclusion. (laughs) (laughs) That's because you were reading chapter four and I figured we have two chapters covered this way. That's not a bad idea. That's not a bad idea. Um, Anyway, so uh, we did that. And and this is very interesting to me because I don't really, I never, I say this a lot with the various other things and it's true. Uh, I never really cared about anything that took place off the battlefield. Okay. Always more interested in the armies and the battles. And within that, more from the high commands perspective, not the the boots on the ground perspective. I find regular people to be typically boring. So that's why I never really was into that stuff. But I'm, a, I'm gaining an appreciation for that stuff as I get older. Um, and, you know, like the town history here in Gettysburg and things like that. And so Men is Cheap is it's talking about free labor in the Civil War. Um, free labor, not, you know, a lot of us think of slavery when we hear the term free labor. I know I did, uh, but that's not what he's talking about there. We get into that in the interview. Um, and uh, this is actually really interesting. I can't wait to actually finish the book in mm-hmm. order um, and uh, and learn more about this side of things. And and I don't know. I, I, it, I recommend it if you can get your hands on it. And actually, I know how you can get your hands on it. Do you know how they can get their hands on it, Bob? I bet it has something to do with Addressing Gettysburg. Of course it does. You go to addressinggettysburg.com slash books, and there it is. It's called Men is Cheap, Exposing the Frauds of Free Labor in Civil War America. Bob, do you want to add anything? Well, just like when Ashley was here, and it was renewed interest then, great interest in the Killed at Gettysburg website. I think if you um, listen to this, and then you'll be interested in looking at the book. I know I... I had my eyes opened about Vanity Fair, and there's some uh, um, illustrations in there. from. You're talking the magazine, Vanity Fair. Yeah, the magazine. Mm -hmm. And the whole concept is very interesting, one that I had never really given much thought of before. That is those um, people in between, the the, the people who are looking to hire substitutes, for example, once the first draft was passed. And uh, how do you get a substitute? Right. <laughs> you know, and if what you don't it, know what right. it is out, how do you get one? So these middlemen, these brokers are. are you know what I meant part. to ask him about the substitutes is what was an, like a typical experience for a substitute? Because I know in uh, in the Ken Burns, which, by the way, Netflix doesn't have Ken Burns again, which this drives me nuts. Every once in a while, it's off. And then I have to tweet them and say, get Ken Burns back, please. Mm. And then they do because they listen to my opinion. (laughs) But um, no, uh, in the Ken Burns thing, I think it's George Templeton Strong talks about how he hired himself a substitute. And so I've always wondered, you know, okay, so you hire yourself a substitute. He says to the guy, you know, anything you need, let me know and I'll make sure that you have it and, you know, all that stuff. Um, But what was it like for a substitute? And like, what kind of a 
crappy situation did you have to be in beforehand to, to go in someone else's stead and possibly die? Like, what a sad life that must have been. I don't know. So anyway, let me just read you this one little review here. Brian P. Lusky has written a highly original and extremely compelling account of how the Civil War, a war fought for freedom, ultimately undermined and narrowed what freedom meant in the United States. A beautifully crafted, closely argued work. And from what I've read of it, I agree with that assessment. And without any further ado, I give you our conversation with Brian P. Lusky. Uh, already in progress. That's right. Okay. So, Brian, what, what made you want to write this book? So, in 2010, I gave a paper about intelligence offices, and uh, that paper was the product of a number of years of and, and work with a number of historians about um, studying um, underground and secondary markets and institutions that facilitated uh, market activity that um, we may not conceive of as part of the mainstream economy, which, but which were actually vital uh, to how the economy worked. Maybe, um, maybe what it was an, an intelligence office. What yeah, is that? An intelligence office is a is a labor agency. Okay, so like a time um, agency. Yeah, and it and it um, it's a it's a place for for workers and employers to come together. Um, to um, uh, to make a, a, a contract, a bargain uh, f- for labor, typically um, uh, domestic servants um, and and household mistresses um, uh, would would be negotiating with a labor broker who was the proprietor of an intelligence office um, in cities, and this institution um, uh, certainly um, was really important for. Um, um, in, in an anonymous labor market um, for, for workers to find work and for employers to find workers. Um, and so it was, it was an absolutely necessary institution. Mm-hmm. Um, but the broker often um, was understood to have to cheat both employers and workers. Okay. Um, they, they might um, uh, uh, take a take a fee from uh, workers who paid that fee thinking they were going to get a job out of it and the broker might not be able to do so the broker could say well that's the state of the market at this time mm. um, workers might be sent to an employer who had also paid a fee um, and they may be disappointed with the workers they got um, and the broker was to blame and so for in in this way this is a way for uh, contemporaries to make distinctions between um, what they considered legitimate and illegitimate uh, market behavior. Um, But as an institution um, that facilitated the workings of of the wage labor economy as a system, um, um, what the intelligence office keeper does um, for employers is to um, help them distinguish um, the ways in which they're operating um, by their own self-interest uh, from the nefarious deeds of the broker mm-hmm. and to say what that broker is doing is bad, but me hmm. taking advantage of vulnerable populations of workers, Irish immigrants among them, mm-hmm. um, that what the, what the employers are doing isn't as bad. Is it kind of like in the South where um, those lousy slave traders but you're <laughs> you need those slave traders if you're a white slave owner i mean precisely yeah. um it's uh blame the middleman right. is is this is the story here um these are these are absolutely necessary figures but um deeply hated ones you know what it reminds me of is uh i i spent some time trying to get into uh show business like uh video production things like that and i remember one time going to a talent agency and they're like, oh, yeah, 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 you know, you can get your work. Uh, we've got people on Law and & Order and this and that and the other thing. And, oh, great, okay. So you need to just get headshots. And and I knew that ahead of time, so I, I brought them with me. I had a friend take pictures, and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We, 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 we got to get more professional-looking headshots. Uh, we have a guy who's <laughs> like $600. So $600 for the headshots, and then, and then this amount of money to be, you know, one of our – to be represented by us and everything like that. Uh, yeah. And I was like – and I already knew ahead of time because I have a friend who is in the business, and he goes, never go to an agent who says you have to pay for him to get you work. There you go. And, and of course, people that do go, I don't know how those are legal today, today in this day and age, because, I mean, they must get enough people work, 
But like, it, it's just shady, you know, because you shouldn't have to pay to get work. Uh, Man, I thought you were going to say as soon as they saw the picture, the headshot of you, they said, no, no, you got to get a more professional head. <laughs> they said you should just get into <laughs> podcasting. <laughs> so here we are. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's how we got here. What is what is the Enrollment Act of 1863? The Enrollment Act of 1863 was patched, passed in March of that year in an effort by um, the U.S. Congress um, to um, to pass a draft um, uh, whereby um, uh, and they set up different classes of of the male population to uh, to, um, to decide who would be drafted first um, with an effort to fill um Union armies, which were depleted um, by um, unsuccessful and costly uh, in in human and financial terms, military campaigns um, previously in the war. Mm -hmm. um, it, um, it included um, a, a, a commutation um, clause or fee that allowed drafted men to pay uh, $300 um, to the government to uh, absolve themselves from from this this call to, to service, so, um, so or okay. they could, or they could hire a substitute okay. to serve in their place. So three hundred dollars, mm -hmm. and and what was the what was the average rate for hiring a substitute? What 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 would you have to do to hire a substitute? So this was uh, in fact the in uh, what why the commutation fee was important, and uh, President Lincoln um, uh, wrote. Uh, a memorandum that he never published, but uh, in defense of the commutation clause, uh, he said, if there hadn't been a commutation clause, then there wouldn't be any ceiling uh, to the amount you might have to pay for a substitute. So what the commutation clause did was to keep uh, substitutes, uh, substitute rates under three hundred dollars. You wouldn't pay. Uh, 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 you wouldn't. You wouldn't pay to hire a substitute if they cost. If they cost yeah. more than the commutation right. fee is the idea. But um, opponents of the commutation clause, of course, said this is very clearly um, evidence of a rich man's war and a poor man's fight, uh -huh. and. Um, um, uh, that lots of people did not have three hundred dollars. Uh, right. Well, so that, what was the that what was the uh, uh, average income back then for people? It, it depended on your occupation. Um, so um, it's um, I, I I can throw some figures out there. Sure, uh, so yeah. if you were uh, a day laborer working on the wharves and docks of New York City, you might make a dollar a day, but. It, that work is um, uh, is seasonal work. Uh, right. You're not working every day all year long, so you might work 250 days a year at, okay. in a good year. So, so that's 250 bucks a year. Uh, a dry goods clerk working in a in a store um, might make between 500 and 600 a year. Um, so you're talking a, a, a sizable chunk of money, right? Uh, Three hundred dollars. How about a um, farmer? But, like what would yeah. they? Well, um, it depends how big your farm was. I guess, <laughs> okay. uh, again, I, I, I hedge on all of these questions. If you're a farm laborer, um, you might make, um, uh, in some rural New York counties, uh, Twelve to thirteen dollars a month, a month, which which is should ring a bell. A that's soldier. right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Uh, with the with except the except with you the don't get your food and that's your clothes right. and <laughs> or that's shot right. at or that, shot at. <laughs> yes. So so there is you know I think I I talk about this a little bit with uh, some of the characters in my book that they may have made that calculation is how much am I making now as, a, as right. a farm laborer and I might also get ra a ration along yeah, with being yeah. a soldier. So that might might seem like a good idea. Uh, there's a soldier named uh, Charlie Bowen who um, who joins up uh, in the in the regulars uh, and is in New York City and he tells his wife in a letter home that he, he had met uh, a, a, a guy who'd become friendly with another soldier who had been a clerk making $600 a year and he said to his wife, you know, why, why I don't understand understand why he's here. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, so that does point obviously to the to the ideological motivations right. of of, sure. of the war as also being important yeah. as as economic yeah. ones. Um, Brian, you mentioned before a rich man's war, a poor man's fight. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk about that phrase? Does it capture any truth or does it mislead a, a little of both? It's certainly been an important uh, way historians have uh, have um, talked about um, 
the 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 demographic makeup of armies Mm -hmm. so um there there is a a, an important recent book by william marvel called lincoln's mercenaries which argues that in fact yes it was a rich man's war and a poor man's fight and he did great uh, research in the census um, and in muster rules to uh, to show how um, there were a lot of impoverished men um, in industrial districts of the north who did who did sign up because of economic motivations. Um, I, I think, though, that um, it's a it's a question that may never be answered because it's it's very hard to parse apart um, ideological motivations from from economic self interest. And I will say that um, uh, I I believe that um, there are all kinds of different um, ways to understand um, soldiers as signing up for economic reasons um, that might include deprivation, but also um, ones of ambition Mm. um, and that they they see the war as a means to to succeed Um, and. I, you know, in in my book, I repackage that that phrase as it's a it's a struggle. The war is a struggle um, that um, that that could make men rich um, because other people were poor. Mm. And so I'm I'm talking about all kinds of um, ambitious men, uh, speculators, brokers, um, and that includes soldiers and officers who um who understood that um, the war for union, the war for free labor ideology, uh, was one in which um, the, the the ability of employers uh, to to employ to hire the workers of their choice was the best way to become more independent, more, See, more free. You mentioned free labor ideology. What mm-hmm. what is that for the listeners that don't know? Sure, um, it's an and ideology me. which. Um, in the 1850s uh, galvanizes a new political coalition, the Republican Party, around the idea that um, that wage workers um, could um, save their wages um, through hard work and perseverance um, and become uh, independent themselves and, and uh, in fact, employ others. Um, it, it posed no um, inherent struggle between labor and capital. Um, And in fact, it was understood at the time that um, there was a harmony of interest between um, employers and employed people. Um, But in that in that ideology, there's also an emphasis on um, the uh, the ways in which employing people was um, uh, the the clearest way to be to be independent. Um, And so um, and and I think uh, many Republican uh, politicians um, who um, use these ideas uh, to proclaim their society's superiority over over slavery in the slave South, um, they downplay the ways in which um, this ideology can justify um, uh, preying upon uh, vulnerable workers. Okay. Um, now you use the term free labor too. So uh, until I read this book, I always associated the term free labor with slaves because yeah. I don't have to pay yeah. for that labor. Right. Right. <laughs> My students too. Right. Okay. I think I, I'm guessing most people might do that. So in this yeah. in this instance, it means something different. Can you go into a little bit more of that? Sure. I, what I mean, uh, whether I talk about free lab- labor ideology or free labor, are, is the, the freedoms that wage labor are supposed to confer upon the people who are engaged in that economic system. Okay. And so, um, uh, as, as I said, uh, politicians are uh, want um, common, ordinary white northerners to, um, uh, to understand um, the ways in which they can be free in ways that enslaved people could not. Mm-hmm. And in fact, the, the alternative is a society where um, slaveholders, an, an aristocracy, had um, amassed um, far too much capital uh, in ways that threatened um, the, the ability of wage laborers and wage labor employers to compete. Right. Um, uh, and it, it it threatened northern society. So, and and I talk about this in the book that um, 
uh, certainly this war for union was a war to um, uh, to destroy this aristocracy, this their aristocracy of 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 slavery's capital. Right. So they're they're. There's a point where these intelligence offices go from being a civilian employment agency to almost like a, a recruiting office. Would that be fair to say? Or, or how would you characterize it when cases, the war starts? Yeah. I mean, so we've talked about these uh, intelligence offices as being both necessary in antebellum America and a scourge. Yeah. Right. A really a really terrible thing. Um, and despite people uh, northerners hating intelligence offices i think it's 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 at least mildly ironic that that's the institution they turn to during the war um, to facilitate the movement of workers in various ways, whether that be recruiting soldiers um, and uh, brokering deals for substitutes and moving moving those people to uh, war fronts in the South, um, to the ways in which benevolent associations uh, in the North and in Washington help move uh, a variety of populations uh, from the South, uh, that would be uh, Confederate deserters, um, white Southern refugees, and um, uh, formerly uh, formerly enslaved people uh, from South to North, okay, um, to serve as uh, as domestic servants and and other uh, agricultural workers uh, in Northern settings uh, okay. during the war. So so the intelligence office becomes a way to um, to mobilize and um, and move laborers, and very often uh, recruiters and brokers come in for the same criticism that they that their counterparts did. Before before the war, right. uh, but again, these people, these brokers, become the, the 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 necessary individuals that help recruit labor, whether for war or for home, uh, that helped um, win the war and um, to win what the war was about for Northern employers. So who, who are some of these brokers that you uh, explore in the book and what are the shady things that they did? Give us some examples. Well, I talk about a, a variety of characters who appear um, throughout the book. I think um, uh, when you when you think about economic history and you might be confronted as a, as a reader like, wow, that's that that might be over my head or like that's going to be about conflicting civilizations. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a, a wage labor economy versus a slave labor economy. That's, of course, true. For sure. Yeah. Um, but I focus on uh, what ordinary individuals do and what they think. And I think that there, there, there are ways in which my characters help propel a narrative uh, of cause and effect along. And so I've I've chosen. Um, uh, a uh, a Philadelphia tobacco uh, merchant who is uh, uh, who holds anti-slavery principles, and uh, those principles make it hard for him to do business with pro-slavery men uh, to 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 uh, uh, buy and distribute and sell uh, sell his tobacco in the North uh, before the war. But he had, this guy's name is Thomas Webster. Uh, he becomes a vital uh, recruiter of, of African-American soldiers, even as toward the end of the war, he's trying to serve his self-interest by getting back into uh, the Southern tobacco mar uh, market once Union armies uh, destroy the Confederacy. Um, there are um, uh, Union officers who um, uh, one's name is uh, Charles Brewster, uh, who served in the in the 10th Massachusetts. Um, he comes to the to the realization that the way to become more independent is to become an officer. And one of the perks of being an officer is being able to to um, to employ a servant. And fortunate for him, his regiment uh, in early 1862 is located um, on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. Um, and there are uh, enslaved people who are um, fugitives from slavery arriving in his in his uh, regiment's camp. So he's a able to um, use that person's labor uh, to um, to become more independent himself. Uh, there are uh, ordinary soldiers who dream of employing uh, uh, African-American women and children, sending them home uh, mm. to help uh, their their wives and, and children um, uh, deal with the uncertainties of the hardships of war. Um, and then there are uh, there are more nefarious folks um, like a guy named John Nelson, who is a, an Irish immigrant who um, is a recruiter uh, in 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 Benjamin Butler's uh, division of New England early in the war. 
um, and he gets into more shady activity in in um, speculation in uh, in cotton and other things in the Mississippi Valley. Uh, and, but then reassigned to Virginia, where he uh, impresses uh, black men against their will into serving in his in a new um, USCT How does he uh, do regiment. That? Um, he has a um, a, a platoon of, of soldiers dressed as zouaves um, uh, force um, uh, African American laborers where he finds them um, uh, uh, farming oysters in the Elizabeth River um, to um, working on what they consider to be their own land in in occupied Virginia, establishing some sense of independence for themselves. They the, this these platoons walk straight up to these folks and um, uh, force them to uh, to report to, to Colonel Nelson and they are um, forced into duty. Now, I, I will say that that's not legal. <laughs> and in fact, um, Nelson is eventually court-martialed. Now, um, so this yeah, platoon, are they, yeah. these are these are black the, soldiers. These are black, these are black soldiers who have already already uh-huh. enlisted um, under the command of, of white junior officers. Um, and they're given quite a bit of latitude uh, into forcing these men to serve. And I, interesting. W- what's interesting about the, the court martial proceedings, though, are the ways in which these um, these impressed men um, talk about their own consent as being something that white officers ought to ought to um, respect ought to respect um, but also that they um, they wanted to enter the military on their own terms and they, right. they understood that citizenship um, uh, entailed uh, obligations as well as benefits so they but they wanted to they wanted to enlist they just didn't want to be forced to do it <laughs> of course right? yeah. um, and so that that opens up an interesting interesting conversation. And of course, uh, Nelson is is convicted. Um, I, I tell that story though in light of uh, Benjamin Butler's um, uh, passage of an order that um, that limits the ways in which uh, wage labor worked in his command in the Department of Virginia and North Carolina at the end of 1863, in which he um, uh, prohibited any uh, any African American man from making more money than a soldier could make. So uh, he, they they could not make any more than ten dollars a month. They could make as much, but not more. That's correct, and and that was a problem for both the many of those men and their their um uh, their the men who had employed them previously because they paid more than that. Yeah. Um. So what Butler was transparently doing was forcing these men into the army. It just wasn't at gunpoint. Right. You know um, what's yeah. interesting is the more like I'm no neo confederate but the the more i learn about uh the off the battlefield behavior of uh people in the union army uh industry government um they're no angels like they you know it's uh, everybody's dirty i'm sure i know this isn't the focus of your book but i'm sure there's examples of something just as shady going on down south Correct in the Confederate Army. So, or I should say, I should say, just to clarify, this was happening in the South. So, yeah. uh, another thing to say about Nelson was, it turns out that he was, um, he was, of course, depending upon the enlistment of these men, so he could start collecting the salary of a colonel, uh, which was uh, over two hundred dollars a month. Okay. Um, but he was also in league with uh, a guy he had named his camp sutler who, um, according to some accounts, was a guy who had been uh, had been recently imprisoned and had broken out of prison in Massachusetts um, to split the proceeds of of um, of what he took in from these same men who had who were forced to buy, um, you know, necessary uh, food, food, stuff, supplement, supplemental foodstuffs and supplies from that sutler. Mm. Um, so in, in so many ways, the, the market uh, for soldiers was circumscribed and in, unless they could uh, make contact with home right, uh, and right. get their families to send stuff. Um, but I, I, I guess to, to answer your question, um, it's important for us to understand, as historians like uh, Chandra Manning have done in, in, in her recent book, uh, Troubled Refuge, is to distinguish between emancipation and freedom. Right. Okay. Right. Those were those were different things. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think we should understand that um, anybody working in in an economy that we might label as capitalism is 
is dependent to various extents on other people's labor and other people's capital. Sure. Right. Um, the, the quest here is for more independence. And in that chapter about impressment, I'm talking about um, recently freed people or they may have been uh, free and living in, in a slave society. Um, uh, black men and women who um, were succeeding in becoming more independent by virtue of the Union Army being there, mm. right? Um, and they were willing uh, to certain as a certain extent um, to do the things that the Union Army wanted them to do um, to, um, uh, to show that they could be good citizens too. Um, uh, but there are there are limits to that. And there was a great deal of, of frustration among among African-American men and women who appealed uh, to the only institution they could think of to um, to rectify the situation. That was the army, too. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, so the very same people who are uh, impressing them are the people they have to go to to try to, to get, get some get, justice. Get some, yeah. That's correct. Yeah. Um, so uh, it. it it doesn't. I, I guess I would say I don't want to suggest that it, it diminishes um, the um, uh, the professed goals of the Union war effort to talk about the self interest of people within uh, within the armies of that of that nation. Um, and in fact, um, you know, leaders going up to Lincoln understood that that self interest mattered. Right. Um, and we could just speak to it um, by um, saying that uh, Nelson had to leave his command in the Mississippi Valley because a new commander, Nathaniel Banks, uh, knew that he was engaging in cotton speculation illegally. Um, and he gave him an option uh, to um, to to be court martialed there or to get a, a, an honorable discharge. And of course, Nelson t- <laughs> took the latter and he and he went. Uh, he didn't go just anywhere. He went to the White House. Huh. Um, and uh, had an interview with Lincoln and Lincoln wrote a, a short note um, that is that is actually in Nelson's court martial file <laughs> um, uh, telling Stanton or asking Stanton, isn't there some command we could put this guy into? He's telling me I've heard, he says, uh, from the best authorities, which, of course, was Nelson himself <laughs> and probably General Butler, uh, who I think wrote him a, a reference letter uh-huh. um, that he was the very type of guy who got this important job done that is recruiting african-american men when the nation needed them and so so um, can we forgive him for his sins because he does this well is I, that he lincoln didn't know about his sins uh, 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 that, that was also uh, an important part of the of the equation um but lincoln needed men like nelson he yeah. had he had to have them um in order to these recruiters were absolutely necessary um to um to ensure um, a larger army. And Lincoln always said to, to uh, political associates, he said, well, why don't you rescind the Emancipation Proclamation now? It's it's creating pl- political havoc for you on the home front. He said, that's, that's impossible. It would be unjust, but it would also um, really imperil our war effort. Right. We, we can't we can't turn our back on emancipation because 180,000 or 200,000 African-American men have been putting their lives on the line for this. Did, did, did I read in the book that uh, initially he had gone to Congress and said, uh, you know, I want to emancipate the slaves, uh, come up with some money. I want to send them back. Is that did or did I misread so, that? So um, at the end of 1862, after he is. Um, uh, issued the preliminary emancipation proclamation in his proclamation to Congress, he suggests another um, financial scheme to end slavery gradually in states that uh, remain loyal to the Union as of January 1st, 1863. Okay, yeah, right, right. So it might have been, um, it's hard to, uh, to, do, to deduce um, Lincoln's um, motivations behind this, other than to say that perhaps he hoped that Confederate um, uh, for, uh, states might decide, having hear, heard from this plan, that we could um, keep our enslaved population enslaved until, say, 1900, and then reap the rewards of a of a bond issue, 
uh, that Lincoln suggested. Okay. Um, but this was certainly something that he hoped he could convince uh, Kentuckians and citizens of Delaware who who still own slaves that they could they could make money out of this. Right. Okay. Um, and that and that a, that a nation with a larger population in 1900 than in 1862 um, could pay that bond issue off more easily. Um, mm-hmm. You end the war faster if if uh, you convince um, uh, rebel states to put down their arms with such a plan. Uh, you save people's lives. And um, in, in some ways, you, um, you save people's money. Now, that, that's not a very good plan for enslaved people. No, no. <laughs> um, and it's something that, uh, in part because uh, loyal slave states say, no, we're going to take our ch- our chances, <laughs> right. Lincoln drops and you know, okay. goes, goes through with the Emancipation Proclamation. And he doesn't, he doesn't talk in those financialized terms anymore. He, um, he does depend more and more on enlisting African-American men in the military, and he understands that white and black Union soldiers are going to have to put their own lives in the line as, as workers doing the work of killing and dying. Mm. Um, and that's that's the way it's it, it had to be right um, uh, for those last two years of the war. OK, so uh, what was the public's view um, of these brokers, these substitute brokers? Like, did they I mean, they didn't like the intelligence offices, so I'm assuming they're probably not going to like these guys either. They don't. Um, and, and of course, substitute brokers are only one of the type of labor brokers I'm talking about here. Um, uh, and so. Uh, I should also say that for any of these brokers, though, they still needed them. So mm. the substitute brokers, if you're a drafted man, you might not know somebody who you can hire to go in your place. It, it comes back to this an, more anonymous labor market. Each community um, th- through the, 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 the different draft calls, and there were there were several, you know, after the passage of the Enrollment Act, um, each community was given a quota to reach. They had to they had to fulfill that quota, or else a draft would happen in their community. Oh. And so their their first goal, town commissioner's goal, is to convince um, local men to enlist voluntarily. And so one way to do that is to um, raise taxes in a community or put together um, kind of um, uh, pools of money. Uh, to give to men who will decide to do that. And a of bounty. Course, yeah, yeah. Yeah. And so that might convince people to enlist um, voluntarily and thus uh, negate the need for a draft within that community. If there aren't enough men, though, they might have to um, look to bigger places to find a supply of laborers who might be willing to go. And if you're in upstate New York, you you, you're not going to know necessarily know um, a New York or New York people in New York City who who might um, be willing to do this. Right. And so you need a broker to to facilitate your um, your community's uh, uh, goal of of reaching your quota. Um, and uh, drafted men have to uh, have to use brokers' offices uh, to find substitutes to hire as well. So let you, you mention a guy, uh, Henry Walker. Yeah, you don't mention him, but you go into him. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's from I think Oneida County, New York. He is, and um, he's a farmer. His son lies about his age in sixty one yeah. and joins up. He says he's twenty one. He's really like sixteen, seventeen years old, something like that. That's correct. And uh, ends up dying of typhoid fever. But he sends letters home and he tells a story about uh, one of his comrades uh, stealing his stuff. And then in, what, 62, I believe, uh, Henry, the father, he enlists. Now, he is expecting this $50 bounty from New York State, $100 from the federal government, $13 uh, pay, which would be a month's pay in advance, Mm -hmm. and then $2 walking around money. Right. And what does he get when he actually enlists? Not that. <laughs> it's, fair, it's fair to say it's it's hard to tell exactly um, exactly what he gets um, out of that. Um, he doesn't I get the full. You made the point though. He yeah, doesn't get the full amount, he and he's told what about the rest that it would come eventually. Eventually, uh, <laughs> so by the um, brokers. N- no, um, he would he would get it through um, various local and state organizations. Um, there's some confusion in the records because the, the regimental history 
um, suggests that the men got this money when they enlisted. Of course. Um, and so that's the official line. But uh, Henry Walker's correspondence with his wife, Persis, um, shows that uh, he was still waiting for the state bounty. Or maybe he's they, just withholding and having fun no, while she's back at now. No, okay. he was not. He was not that kind of guy. Oh, all right, all uh, right. And I don't think Persis would let him be <laughs> that kind of guy. Um, I, he wanted her. Uh, kind of the way in which ordinary soldiers might deal with that, um, with being unable to get the bounty immediately, was to convince neighbors. Um, uh, in economic transactions um, to basically open a line of credit on the basis of that eventual payment of the bounty. So um, the, the understanding would be, I will pay you or we will pay you as a household when that bounty money arrives. Right. Yeah, he encourages his wife to do that, yes. as you said, right? Yes, that's, yeah. that's correct. So um, this this uh, this county, Oneida County, um, he, he's from a town called Forestport, north of Utica. Um, they put they raise taxes uh, um, or, or I, I, maybe they issue bonds um, to um, to raise money for for bounty. So they're a community that does this. Um, and so soldiers are getting part of the um, the advertised payment. We all know the recruiting posters with all the, the payment information on them. But it is, I think, important to know that um, that soldiers didn't get what they what they were promised. Right. And they were pretty frustrated about it. Um, but that um, these these promises to payment um, as well as the payment themselves were the very things that were getting men to enlist. Um, uh, and so there, the, the other thing that, um, that troubles soldiers is they're, they're promised their monthly pay every other month so that you get a two month uh, pay packet. Okay. Um, it's like getting uh, paid and, biweekly almost. Yeah, yeah except, <laughs> except every, every two months. The problem was that, that, um, that in reality, um, at, at several junctures during the war, that period extended to four to mm. six months and beyond. Why? Um, what what was the trouble that they were having? When, was it being intercepted? Uh, in, in, a, in the most charitable way I can describe this is that soldiers on the move made it harder oh. for paymasters to get to keep up to get to them. Um, but it 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 also speaks to the bureaucrat, bureaucratic. Uh, bureaucratic snafus of of the war, and yeah. so um, uh, they had to um, open lines of credit with sutlers, with junior officers, with 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 senior officers too, um, who would um, who would give them loans uh, so they could get by. Um, but some of these uh, characters I focus on in this book, they talk about. Um, you know, men depending on the, their families at home uh, for, mm. for access to stuff. And, and they're very, um, they demonstrate uh, themselves to be very savvy uh, consumers. You know, they, they don't want just, um, uh, you know, a particular product. They want a particular brand name product. Yeah. Or, <laughs> you know, so and they, and they, they say you could get this. Uh, this is true of Brewster when he's trying to tell his mother about what he needs for his new lieutenant's uniform and the sword, the scabbard and everything. You can get these things at the manufacturing in Chicopee, which is, you know, 15 <laughs> miles from home. So, yeah. and, and he, you know, he, he's working with a particular tailor. Right. Um, and he, you know, this is someone he's known as his, entire life uh who's made clothes for for him and his family before so um if especially if you're a junior officer um you're going to have better better contacts to a home market than a than a ordinary private would be and so somebody like walker um sets up a side business in repairing right, shoes right and that's the way he um he um he makes money in a in a time of of uh, of where he's deprived of wages even though his fellow comrades are also, are also deprived also deprived yeah. of wages, and that means that Walker often has to wait uh, for his for his book debts to become cash. So it's like everybody's waiting on everybody That's to right. get paid. You, I, I think it's him. Um, you mentioned that he writes back, and and he want I forget that what the item is. 
he wants some piece of uh, some item for his shoe repairing business and he says something like, or maybe it's the other guy maybe it's but anyway yeah. whatever the item is uh-huh. he says you know I had one uh, you can get one for around ten dollars yep. I got I had one I sold it for fifteen and I only spent three fifty on it there's something that you know who I'm talking that's about cor- that's correct yeah I mean soldiers would would write to their 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 mothers their their sisters their wives in this sort of way um uh demonstrating their own knowledge of the market. I think what's also interesting, though, is that these women all prove themselves in this correspondence to be very, um, very knowledgeable about market well, activity. Sure. Yeah. And so there's one there's one case in which Persis Walker um, gets a letter from Henry saying, I need a pair of warm gloves. I'm out here uh, digging fortifications around Washington. Um, I need um, I need two dollars. And she 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 sends him a pair of heavy gloves and a dollar bill because she got those gloves for, for a dollar. dollar. Yeah, she got them so, for less. So, um, you know, I and I, I the other thing about uh, the, fa- the the families back home is they're left having to negotiate um, with neighboring men who had promised Henry that they would um, um, open lines of credit, give loans, um, uh, maybe even pay rent to help on the a house out. to help yeah. the family out. And Persis writes to him. We only have one letter from her, but it's very clear from what he writes back to her. What she was saying is <laughs> these guys aren't living up to the the promises they made. Yeah. Um, and they they call these people, you know, uh, basically akin to rebels hmm. um, that they would dare to to uh, to cheat um, uh, a soldier, a, a, a defender, field, yeah. a defender yeah. of yeah. the nation. Yeah. Um, with staying on Walker for a second mm-hmm. there. So when he enlists, there's all the issue with the pay and the bounty and all that stuff but then he gets to his station at for at um, Arlington Heights was it Arlington that was where the sun ended up and that's where he died Oh, okay. So um, where does Walker go? So Henry, Henry yeah, yeah, Henry Walker um, serves around D.C. Um, uh, and then is um, is stationed down uh, in uh, of Folly Island, South Carolina. So he okay. um, uh, he was in the group of men who, uh, among whom the the fifty fourth Massachusetts attacked Fort Fort Wagner, but then moves back to the the Virginia coast uh, to to Yorktown. Okay, um, before then being uh, deployed in the. Um, uh, the Bermuda Hundred campaign and the campaign uh, toward toward Petersburg in 1864. Yeah, when when he does get down to I think it's the D.C. area at first. Yeah, yeah. Um, he experiences the same thing his son did, and that someone steals his stuff. Yep. Yeah, and and that must have uh, like that, that's that's sad. Like you, I felt bad for the Walker family. I, I know, don't. They, it, I don't blame you. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot. There's a lot to feel bad for them about. Um, it's not the only time that that Henry gets money stolen from him. And I should say that he, among the characters, is the most um, the most clearly. Um, uh, kind of, he's the one who believes in free labor ideology the most in 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 a very very um, uh, almost naive way. Um, he tells his wife and his daughters who remain at home, you know, we all have to work hard. Um, that's the only way we're going to prosper. It, it seems clear that they're they're farming rented land. They aren't landholders themselves. Mm. They they don't they don't measure up to that standard of independence uh, through land ownership that was so important to Americans at the time, but they're working really hard and they're following the precepts kind of, you know, akin to, you know, Benjamin Franklin and poor Richard's almanac, that sort of thing. Um, (laughs) um, And he does get, he does get cheated out of, out of, um, out of, out of his, out of his money from, from time to time uh, by comrades who we can appreciate our, also have their have their backs to the wall economically too and they have they have families back home it's not to justify their their theft but but, uh, we can understand maybe why they why they did it um but um what's also interesting and maybe doesn't it certainly does not speak so well of henry walker um that when he's when he's stationed in yorktown in the summer of 1863, he's stationed to um, as kind of a guard on a guard duty to protect um, a, a slaveholder's plantation who had who had just recently um, um, pledged his allegiance to the United States. Um, and he looks out at this um, this um, slaveholder's field and sees three uh, enslaved women working in in a, a garden, and he writes to his wife and says, wouldn't it be 
uh, wouldn't it be great if one of these quote unquote black and shiny women, I, I could I could take one and bring bring one home to work for you. And so even as he's kind of displaying all of this faith in free labor ideology that workers will advance mm. um, at some point, if they just put their nose to the grindstone, if I can just I can just repair that next pair of shoes and get this money to you and not have it stolen, like things are going to be better for us. He kind of he kind of looks toward emancipation as the moment in which he and, and Persis can uh, can activate um, an African American w- woman's hard work uh, to serve them, to serve in, them in, their yeah. que- in their quest for household independence. So I think that you know, even there in in that example of Henry Walker, you see um, kind of the the ways in which the the um, free laborers' ideologies f- focus on uh, the the uh, the ability of employer to get workers that they that they that they craved yeah. uh, was the most important thing. Yeah. What is the uh, Citizens Bounty Fund? Duh. Fund. Yeah. Um, the Citizens Bounty Fund was was set up by uh, by Philadelphians, uh, a, a fund chaired by uh, a character in my book, Thomas Webster, uh, this erstwhile uh, tobacco merchant now turned recruiter, first of white soldiers in 1862. This bounty fund is um, a fund set up uh, to entice through a local bounty, in addition to the federal bounty, a city bounty uh, that would be paid to paid to Philadelphians uh, when they when they enlisted. So it's a way for um, uh, elite Philadelphians to contribute to that fund uh, to to pay other Philadelphians to serve um, voluntarily again, mm-hmm. um, but but suggesting that self interest mattered in convincing persuading men to to serve. The problem with that bounty fund is that some of the soldiers who enlisted, as we talked before, um, didn't get access to that bounty money immediately, and they immediately thought that a fraud was being committed. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, so there's you know fear of the brokers and the recruiters, but then there's uh, uh, something of an equivalent concern that emerges about the the fund commissioners, um, and the 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 commissioners and the fund, uh, its cashier, which uh, whose job it was to distribute the money, was also concerned that when he paid the fund the the, the bounty to the the local bounty to these men, that they would um, abscond, they would yeah. they would be a bounty jumper. Uh, there were a lot of cases of that happening. Um, and so he basically set up more or less uh, bankers hours where he's like, I'm going to pay the bounty right. between the hours of 11 and one on the day that these men get on the train to go to the front. They're going to have to they're going to have to be dressed in their uniform. I'm going to pay them at the barracks. Uh, if if they don't follow all these rules, I'm not going right. to pay them at all. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then if they if they jump bounty from there, uh, it's not my fault. Did. Did uh, I, I get like, like I got news for y'all? Like the, the, my friend is uh, in the Air Force, and last about a year ago, um, they moved him down to Florida, but they were behind on his pay from when he was stationed in Maryland, and then they were falling behind on his pay from after the transfer down to Florida and then they finally caught up and sent him his Maryland pay and and all this and he's been behind on his pay uh, and then they just moved him to Savannah and he had the same problem with his pay you know all this so we're not in wartime this is modern day computers everything's electronic and still they're behind on getting a federal employee money. My, I guess my question is, and Bob, if you have more questions, oh, uh, this is my last uh, prepared question. Um, my question is, why? Like, why Why all these middlemen? Was it just opportunists that came up with something that said, hey, uh, here, federal government, we can make it easier on you, um, or what, what, what the hell? Yeah. Why? I come back to my, my earlier point about um, the government being unable to uh, recruit without them. Okay. Um, and so uh, that that may be a, a somewhat contentious claim because, of course, the draft was a failure. Mm. Um, it didn't get the number of men that um, that was expected from it. Um, uh, but these these uh, so that they. 
in an anonymous labor market, you needed middlemen like this. Um, I will also say that brokers could always, the substitute brokers especially, could always say that um, they were working for the nation's interest, right? Uh-huh. Um, by trying to fulfill the, um, uh, the draft, um, they were doing the nation's bidding. And I, in fact, in my book on the, on the, 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 the opening pages, there's a, uh, a, a photograph of some of these bounty brokers, substitute brokers, who are um, depicted outside of their office, and there's a huge American flag flying above them. Right, right. right. Um, one pair of, uh, of bounty brokers who were particularly notorious tried to launder their proceeds from this market by by buying uh, something like twenty thousand dollars in in U.S. bonds, yes. so they're basically um, using that money uh, that they had gotten from ill-gotten, uh, Ill, Ill-gotten gains, uh, laundering it uh, through the the very financial instruments that were were Helping assisting the assisting yeah. the war effort. Yeah, so it, it's uh, I, I think that you know I, I take your point. I mean, these guys clearly are um, taking advantage of of a market opportunity. Yeah. Right. Um, but I think there's so many people, especially drafted men and the town commissioners who are trying to fill quotas that needed these men. They wouldn't, they wouldn't know how to navigate an anonymous market without them. Yeah. And these men claimed that they had special knowledge. Right. right. And that's why intelligence it's, it's a question of information, right? That, that that's where you can go to these intelligence offices and get information that you couldn't get anywhere else. And now, also or, I'm guessing like in fairness to the people of the time and, and the government and all that stuff is it was all new to us. Right. I mean, we haven't had a big war like this where we needed drafts and, Am I correct yeah. in that? Like they, they just well, didn't know what to do. There were earlier drafts, uh, but I, I think that uh, what I what I contend in the book is that this institution, um, excoriated, hated as it was, was really the only the only institution that people would think of that could that could serve as a model. Yeah. Uh, for moving. So it was uh, the devil they know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, I guess it didn't. It didn't stop them from complaining about that devil. Of course not. We're and Americans. As, as I said, <laughs> as I said, um, what the what the substitute broker allowed um, employers to do is to say, look at. I mean, what I'm doing is serving my self interest. If if they were honest, they would say, well, yeah, I'm trying to look for a vulnerable person who can do this work <laughs> for me. Um, and some some of us might say, well, that's you know not maybe the best thing you could do. But but they could say, look at that substitute broker. What that person is doing is horrible. Right, <laughs> right. right. You, we can all agree that yeah. what they're doing is worse. Yeah. Um, but I think they both reflect. They both illuminate what wage labor was, too, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? Um, as a system that goes beyond kind of the the platitudes of of, of free labor ideology and, and kind of the idea that workers would advance uh, from being a worker to being independent. Right. Right. Okay. Bob, you got anything? Yeah, a couple. Okay. So these intelligence officers or the brokers, they have many different tools that they can use to try to get desperate labor into the system that they're trying to facilitate. Could you talk about some of those tools or maybe I just want to know about alcohol? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's fun. Yeah. Um, so uh, to return to the question of how the substitute market worked, um, these brokers, um, th- th- by, by offering um, higher and higher bounties and then um, getting rid of the commutation clause in the summer of 1864 and thus um, creating a, a competitive market for, for the hiring of men to be substitutes. Um, what that does in theory is to create the circumstances in which workers, um, maybe uh, unlike most labor markets, have some leverage um, to be able to bid up their, uh, their, their price. Right. Um, And uh, substitute brokers, though, take advantage of that, um, uh, um, that quest for for profit among workers um, to um, uh, take hundreds of dollars from each one of them. And they in fact, as you suggest, there were uh, several recruiting offices or uh, brokerage offices that were. Um, not only next to, but connected to taverns. 
<laughs> and so uh, a broker might uh, take a, a prospective substitute into the bar for a drink or seven <laughs> and and, um, and tell that mark that they were just going to go into the next room to talk with uh, an army or navy official um, and work out um, uh, a, a, a payment package in which the broker would be paid most of the most of what was owed to the substitute. The substitute would get um, a smaller payment usually of fifty or a hundred dollars, and the broker would say, "You will be paid." Um, the rest once you get on board the rendezvous ship. And of course, they'd wake up in a drunken stupor, wonder, you know, wonder, how did I get here? <laughs> and 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 then, um, you know, the reason why I, I know about a lot of these men is that a, 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 a Union Army, a War Department a detective named Lafayette Baker was sent to New York City to investigate. Uh, and he was able to apprehend a, a, a fair number of the brokers and um, the uh, the bounty jumpers uh, in New York City and, and the surrounding area. Um, but by the end of his time there, uh, Baker's um, Baker was hearing news that um, there were recruitment agents, substitute brokers impersonating his detectives and basically um, uh, stopping a, a ordinary people at, at gunpoint or to say you're coming with us oh um, unless unless you pay us off right now um, and so e even even then you know uh, there the this this scheme changes shape changes its face right um, under these circumstances in which they're being investigated they take on the persona of the investigators <laughs> and that's a way to continue the operation um, but at the same time Baker is also hearing news Hearing, hearing from people saying, um, I, I, um, um, I, I was in the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, I'm, I'm not really involved in this. I got caught up with bad men, but I'm not really bad. And so there are lots of people saying, yeah, there's fraud in this market, but I didn't do it. <laughs> okay. You know, uh, so that's the, you know, the other thing to complicate our understanding of this is that, um, yes, um, people were being duped into service, it duped um, uh, uh, economically, leaving their, their wives and families to try to figure out how to recoup the money that, that they knew was owed to them. Um, but on the other hand, um, they, what, they, what they didn't in, entirely um, fess up to, some of these uh, people complaining to Baker was that they had entered this market so that they could profit. Right. 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 They, they want access to lots of money. <laughs> right. Um, and um, uh, so there's there's uh, certainly, uh, you know, multiple ways of, of looking at this this question. Are there any instances uh, that, that are in the book now for just to be fair or not, not fair, but just to let everybody know. I read the introduction in chapter four because we didn't have enough time to read the whole book before you came in. So, um, and then Bob, you read the introduction in chapter one. Is that correct? And the, some and, of the conclusion. And some of the conclusion. Oh, okay. You got to the end. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but do, uh, do you have any instances of men? Because I'm thinking to myself, I'm, you know, I'm not making a ton of money. I'm renting a farm. I'm working it. I've got a, a family. My son just died, and then I hear in, in the war, and then I hear, oh, I can get you know a couple hundred bucks bounty just for joining up. Um, that's that's going to go far for my wife back home. I also believe in the cause, so okay, I've been on the fence, but that's pushing me over. Now I'm going to join the army, and I join the army, and then they start playing all these shenanigans with my money. I want my money, right? And uh, so me in my head, I'm like. There is no tomorrow in this army. I'm gone. I'm done. You broke your end of the deal. And and I'm not holding up on my end of the bargain. I don't care. And, and frankly, I don't believe in the system that is going to do this to the people who are going to fight for it. And so I'm done. Of course, I'll get shot. But whatever. My point is, do we have instances of desertions because of that in protest of the the nonsense with the money? So there there were instances of, of desertion. Um, the... Um I guess where this comes out in my book the most is in passages about uh, the soldier and the officer in the 10th Massachusetts, Charles Brewster, who condemns um, the um, condemns both the men who desert um, 
who who have recently been paid bounties. So they th- this regiment is you know ravaged by the campaigns of sixty two and sixty three. They need more men, uh, and in fact, sometimes Brewster is part of the recruiting party that that goes back north uh-huh. uh, to to try to get uh, new soldiers. Um, he has a lot a lot of bad things to say about these new recruits and thinks them completely self-interested and the the men who do desert he wants to send um a, a a platoon back back home to find them and the people who who help them hide and uh basically you know at at gunpoint force those people back into the army but he also says that it's that he in some ways he he criticizes the enrollment act itself and he says these people who are coming now don't have a stake in this contest and for him, um, the people who do have a stake are ambitious men like him, mm. um, whom Southern slaveholders had long derided as mud sills, as work, working people who would never rise um, in, a, in a wage labor system that ground up its poor and threw them into the gutter. Right. That, was, that was the Southern response, uh, the Southern slaveholders' response to free labor ideology. Huh. Um, um, he he took on that label of mud sills and said this is this is our revolution our middle class revolution against that slaveholding capitalist aristocracy interesting um and so he felt like he and people like him had a particular stake in this struggle um that that poorer people didn't have um and so i i think like i mean even like just saying that out loud i think tells us something beyond what we've known about. We've known the Civil War is about revolutions, right? It's, right, the, right? it's the Confederate revolution against the federal government. It's the the revolution among enslaved people. Yeah. To, this, is, this is the greatest, as, as the historian Stephen Hahn has said, the, the greatest and most successful slave rebellion that ever was, um, <laughs> the Civil War. Um, but we don't often think of what northern soldiers were doing, and particularly this, this kind of middle class, employing class, Mm. Uh, or prospective employing class, mm. the the ambitious northerner, that it was there. It was, it was a revolution for yeah. them too. At it least was they a hoped. chance for every level of society to rise up in some way or another. I, indeed, and and for for a for a officer like Brewster, a northern officer like Brewster, the it was the it was the the slaveholding class which was the greatest impediment to them moving up. Right? Huh. That's interesting. It's the rising tide that raises all ships. The, the the enslaved become free. Well, they know they become emancipated because you're right. I never realized that we always say, oh, yeah, Lincoln freed so, the slaves. Mm-hmm. No, he didn't. He emancipated them, but they had a long way to go before they got freedom. I, I think it's important to say, though, that these three revolutions were happening at once. N- um, none of them got exactly what they had hoped for. Yeah, right. Yeah. And so I, I will say that uh, in in every way that Charles Brewster thought the the slaveholders were the greatest impediment to his independence he looked to emancipated people to work for him um to support that independence yeah. right he needed he needed access to emancipated people um to be the independent man he hoped he would become it's fascinating you got more about yeah um great book and very interesting. Um, I'm not going to ask you to get into this right now, but just tell the listeners that uh, you might want to read about Vanity Fair and look at some of the interesting photographs from Stevens. Was that the name of the man who did not photographs, uh, drawings? Yes. That got yeah. Very yeah. comical, but you know, just be a little bit warned that it might not be politically correct today. Some of the things it, that he's indeed not writing not. about. Yeah. Yeah. But. Um, <laughs> My, my last question is is the title of the book, Men is Cheap. Can you talk about that? Sure. Uh, thanks for asking. Um, <laughs> it, it is uh, grammatically erroneous. Um, uh, I, I know that. It some is? People have, some people have said, um, wait, I, I, th- that's wrong. <laughs> um, it, it's, a, it's from a quotation from a substitute broker writing back to his bosses in New York City. And what he... Uh, hopes to communicate to them by saying men is cheap. Um, that's a, that's a phrase I should say that m- might lead us to believe that what he was saying was um, uh, something akin to what slaveholders themselves were doing. To think of men as things, 
um, mm. and in the aggregate. Um, and so singular, <laughs> right? Singular uh, use of the verb um, that, that they are cheap and, and, and commodities. And therefore, we should understand this this um, uh, this uh, system of, of substitute brokerage as akin to slavery. And I say, no, that's that's actually not true, that this is uh, very clearly uh, a wage labor system. And in fact, big business. Um, and what um, this substitute broker was was lamenting was that um, brokers were not able to get the amount of money um, from town commissioners uh, and 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 other people looking for substitutes like they had before because he understood that those town commissioners had filled their quotas. OK, there, there was not enough demand for substitutes and that depressed the price of substitutes. And so that that was bad news for the brokers and he wanted his employers to know that. Um, so that's what he meant by that. Uh, men is cheap. Right. Kind of like a farmer might say, because there's too much corn production, sure. corn is cheap. That's right. right now. That's yeah. right. Yep. Um, men is cheap is available on the recommended reading section on our website, addressing Gettysburg.com slash books. Um, I forgot my copy when I was leaving the house today and I wanted you to sign it. So can I give it to Ashley and have her bring it home? To of course. Have you of course. Okay. Because I'm trying to get a collection going of all the, the authors I have on with signed yeah. books. University stuff. of North Carolina Press. And correct. Just, I mean, it's February 25th today. Just released. It just yeah. came out. Yeah. That's correct. Yeah. And, and was, was Men is Cheap the uh, title that you were always going with? Or? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Because I remember Ashley was. saying something about uh, he's not sure on the title yet, but he's so <laughs> far. Yeah. But all right. That's pretty good. Anyway, so yeah, like I said, addressinggettysburg.com slash books. You can find the book there. And of course, if you purchase that, it's an Amazon link, but that uh, that helps us out and it doesn't cost you a dime more than uh, what you were going to spend on it anyway. So anything else? Bill, do you, Bill, our studio audience, Bill is here. Do you have a question for uh, Brian? Um, Wait, Bill, come here. Speaking of the mic. So have have you looked at anything on the uh, the Fort Nagley out, outside of Nashville? Have you ever read anything about that or not? I have not. They they were, uh, it didn't matter if you were free black or slave. The Union Army rounded them all up right off the streets and put them up on the hill where Fort Nagley was built. And a lot of these, a lot of these men perished because they were uh, kept in just absolutely horrendous conditions and fed poorly and worked hard. Um, and that was kind of a, we kind of touched on that a little bit. Uh, I don't know if that's really a question or not, but sure, just an that, that's interesting. I mean, certainly um, uh, there were um, there were these these instances in which uh, the Union Army's need for for laborers um, trumped concerns for um, the 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 protection, care, and livelihoods of the, the the of the people who were who were brought to these these locations um, beyond the the people who were going to do the labor, their their families and 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 um, uh, and loved ones, yeah. Very good, Brian. Uh, Bill, sorry, you're Brian. You're Bill. <laughs> and I'm Bill. Bob. We're the three Bs. <laughs> that was very good because uh, Bill just uh, got here um, last month from Bulgaria. He's never been oh, here before, and he knows everything. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. He's not from Bulgaria. <laughs> He's from the area. Uh, okay, so look again. Now, thank you, Brian. Lesson. Brian, you're a professor at Shepherdstown, correct? No, at, no, at what? West Virginia. Oh, West Virginia. Mor Morgantown. Morgantown. Yeah, Morgantown. Got, Morgantown. Yeah, quite the commute. Yeah. yeah. How, yeah. Long, how long does it take you to drive to Morgantown from here? He lives in Gettysburg area. Mm -hmm. Three hours. Mm -hmm. Yep. And not and every day, I hope. No. Not every God. day. Yeah, that's, jeez. <laughs> All right. Men is cheap. Dressinggettysburg.com slash books. Brian Lusky, thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Matt. Too bad gas isn't cheap. Uh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs>